Athletic Greens, now known as AG1, has become one of the most popular health supplements on the market. Every single podcast that I listen to seems to be promoting it, whether it's Andrew Huberman, sponsors Athletic Greens, Athletic Greens AG1, Joe Rogan, or now my new favorite, Modern Wisdom, I just cannot seem to escape it. And now it also seems that Dr. Peter Artia is the scientific advisor. And if you've searched on YouTube already, you've probably seen some Athletic Greens reviews, but this one is going to be different. If you're new around here, my name is Adam McDonald. I'm a performance nutritionist with an MSc natural competitive bodybuilder and a coach for health and fitness for high performance men. In this channel, we try and take complex health and fitness topics and break them down into practical applications. So rather than going into whether I like the taste or not, or I've had a good anecdotal experience with AG1, I'm going to use my experience as a performance nutritionist and as somebody who's conducted primary research to go into detail whether or not the ingredients and dosages in AG1 match up with the current scientific evidence. So what we are going to do in this video is we're going to look at the label, we're going to look at the ingredients, the dosages of those ingredients and see whether those ingredients actually have beneficial outcomes in the scientific literature. So first up when looking at the label, this is the most up-to-date one that I pulled off the website. You can see a whole host of vitamins and minerals. And if you're taking AG1 for that reason, as a substitute multivitamin or as a powdered multivitamin, this is pretty well rounded and I think it does a good job in this area, but I do not think that most people are taking AG1 for this specific purpose because it's pretty expensive. Now the next thing on the list, which we're gonna look at is the probiotics. This is a huge selling point for AG1. Probiotics in Athletic Greens are optimal and vital for microbiotic health. AG1 contains bifidobacteria and lactobacilli, both of which are two of the most studied bacteria in the human body and are really important for overall health. Now, if you're born through a regular vaginal birth or you've been breastfed as a child, you'll have more of these in your overall system. And that means that you're probably going to have better health outcomes. So for those who don't know, probiotics are essentially the supplemental form of these bacteria. So the mechanisms through which these bacteria are supposed to work are number one, decreasing the overall amount of bad bacteria bacteria in your gut. Number two, increasing the intestinal and gut integrity, essentially less things getting in and less things getting out. And then third is supposed to work by modulating the immune and nervous system. So some probiotics do work in specific cases such as IBS or inflammatory bowel disease or even antibiotic induced diarrhea. But in otherwise healthy individuals, there is a paucity or lack of just overall scientific evidence showing that they have any beneficial effects whatsoever. This paper by Rinanella and colleagues named what is a healthy gut microbiota says richness and diversity of gut microbiota shaped in early life characterize a healthy gut microbiota composition however this optimal healthy gut microbiota composition is different for each individual the challenge is researchers don't really know what a healthy gut microbiota is and it's a pretty nebulous term the general consensus amongst researchers is that a rich balanced and diverse microbiota is going to be the healthiest one and have the best health outcomes however probiotics don't really seem to help this at all dr gabrielle fundaro who who's done research on the gut and has been on my Health Mastery podcast before says, given the variability in individual microbiomes, diets, bacterial strains, and study design, it is difficult to make conclusive statements about the effectiveness of over-the-counter probiotics. But what we do know is, and this is backed up by a lot of research, is that prebiotics, which are type of fiber found in fruits and vegetables, actually provide the nutrients for the organisms in your gut to become more diverse and more populated. And Dr. Lane Norton actually mentioned this on the Huberman podcast. So, the research seems to really clearly suggest that eating enough fiber, which is again, a prebiotic, that that is a better way to get a, a healthier gut per se than probiotic. Dr. Fondaro also says, considering the limitation of probiotic supplementation and high cost of prebiotic supplements, it's more prudent to simply meet the RDA of fiber by eating a variety of whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes to support a diverse microbiome. So to sum up, taking probiotics and not eating fruits and vegetables, specifically the fiber in fruits and vegetables, is literally stepping over dollars to pick up pennies, even though you're probably paying a lot more dollars to actually buy AG1. Now, when it comes to the other ingredients in AG1, this is where it starts to get a little bit sketchy. As you can see, there's a proprietary blend, meaning that they don't show how much of each ingredient is in the product. Now, companies do this for two reasons. Number one, they do this so their competitors cannot just make a carbon copy of their product. And this is the reason that they want you to think why they have a proprietary blend. And number two is, and this is the reason that they don't want you to know, is they can put less of specific ingredients, particularly the more expensive ones, and underdose them without you ever knowing. Now, Athletic Greens is a US-based company, meaning they need to follow the rules and guidelines of the Food and Drug Administration. And according 
According to the rules on the website of the FDA, pending on the type of ingredient, the amount per serving must be declared as quantitative amount by weight as per percentage of daily value or both. Therefore, in AG1, since they are not listed in terms of daily value percentage, they're listed in terms of weight from highest to least. And this is kind of worrying. Spirulina, which is the number one listed ingredient and therefore in the most abundance, has some effects in terms of reducing inflammation, but not really much in overall healthy individuals. This is the supplement that probably gives AG1 the really dark green color. But when we're looking at the research specifically, the benefits that you get are usually around eight grams in the meta-analysis that I've looked at. And this means that it either takes up 75% of the 12 grams or else it's just underdosed in AG1. Looking down the list, lecithin, apple powder, and pea protein, they don't really have much benefit. Okay, sure, pea protein isolate is a good supplement to have and it's a good source of protein, but what are a couple of grams going to do? Not much. When we get to inulin, which is the fifth ingredient on the label, this is when I start to really get concerned. Inulin is a type of fiber, and if we're looking at the grams of fiber per serving, there are two grams of fiber per serving. If I'm being really conservative and saying that everything above inulin only contains two grams of each ingredient, that's still concerning because that's a total of 10 grams out of 12 for the first five ingredients in this supplement, meaning that there's only two grams left for all of the other supplements combined. But this is likely inaccurate, and I would say the first four ingredients contain more than two grams each, meaning that there's more likely one gram of total ingredient left for all of the other ingredients after inulin. When you take away sweeteners and caking agents, that number just gets lower and lower. When looking at examine.com, it appears that chlorella and spinach extract are pretty effective when you get into multiple grams, but we seem to only have one gram left. Then taking into account that the effective dose of rhodiola rosea and ashwagandha can be up to 600 milligrams, we can be almost guaranteed that literally every supplement or ingredient within this proprietary blend is underdosed. So why are all these big podcasts pushing AG1? Athletic green. Athletic greens. Athletic greens. Number one, it's most likely really, really underdosed. And number two, even at effective dosages, these supplements or ingredients don't really do much for otherwise healthy people who are majority of the people who are using it. What I don't think that the likes of Andrew Huberman or Joe Rogan or Chris Williamson are charlatans, and I genuinely do think that they use AG1 every single day, even if they do get it for free. It's just that these guys are not nutrition experts, nor have they done the due diligence to actually spend time to go in and look at the research in the way that I've done. And secondly, and probably the elephant in the room, is that there's a huge financial incentive. I found this website called affiliate.com and they said that Athletic Greens affiliates and AG1 affiliates get 30% commission for each sale. If you look at Andrew Huberman podcasts across all platforms, he gets around a million downloads per episode. And even if 0.001% of the people who listen to the podcast or watch the podcast bought AG1 at $100 per month, which is the current price, he would get 30,000 US dollars per episode. So you can't really disregard the financial incentive by these influencers and podcasters push AG1, especially if they think it's actually a good product. So what are the alternatives if AG1 is not cut out to what it's supposed to be? Well, I don't think there's a major problem with taking AG1 if you're happy to pay for it. Probably has a neutral to very, very, very modest benefit, but the claims are just unsubstantiated made by Athletic Greens, and you're probably not gonna get the benefits that you think. And as the popularity of AG1 has grown over the last number of years, I found that more and more consultations that I do with men who have health or weight loss problems, they are using AG1 thinking that that's going to solve their problems. So if you're starting any new health, fitness, or supplement regime, ask yourself, what am I trying to achieve? How do I know if I'm making progress? And how do I track that over time? The same is true with business. Most people will know that if you're trying to improve business, you don't just say, I want to improve my business. You focus on a specific task or metric, and then you measure that over time. And if things aren't working, then you change it. So as Naval Ravikant says, if you play silly games, you will win silly prizes. So I hope you found this video helpful and informative. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below. And if you want help on your health and fitness journey, check out my coaching program in the link in the bio.